is the truth. 47 years of age. I've spent 20 years in prison. The first time I was in prison for murder. I've done 17 years, 8 months or something. And then I got, I got out. I was out about two years. And I got recalled. Uh, I, I tried to escape from the busies when they nicked us, when they were recalling us, the company door. Busy ended up. I struggled with it busy that much because I come and knocked on my door and asked us if I, uh, someone had stole a, a stolen car, a BMW, brand new BMW from doing the road. We doing Devon somewhere or something, you know, and, and, and I had parked it outside my house. Well, this was the second stolen car from that had been parked outside my house because this was a Second busy to knock on me door this one morning, ask inquiring about the stolen car. Now I used to steal cars for fun when I was a Ben, and you know I didn't do that sort of thing anymore. Uh, I would not help to steal a car, and I've never tried to find out how to steal the cars these days. A very technical now, so I didn't bother with that now. So I think it's just safe me answering the door to this busy and seeing it's gotten out today with me who stole the car. Well, the two coppers at the door, they weren't having it. I told them that I told them that I was having, I had no idea who had stole the car, it had nothing to do with me. Uh, so they said, can we come in your house? I says, no. He says, oh, we're going to arrest you for obstruction. So I uh, uh, fucking kicked off. I, well, I didn't kick off straight away. I was nice and calm to begin with. But the police were taking the piss out of us and all that when I was cuffed up. So when I was, they were taking us to the car, I started struggling. With a busy old who had his cuffed. Uh, and the other busies, because as I was coming out and they were putting taking us down the street to the car, right? The people who had stolen the car thought that, oh, they're just nicking him, they've got nothing to do with that stolen car. So they come with a hoose from across the street and beep the car just as I was coming out. They were just kind of jumping and fuck off being cocky. Instead of waiting for the busies to go and see what the sc full score was. Right? So, the fucking, the beef sat, all the busies, the busies just looked, couldn't believe it and all that. Jumped on these, on these blokes, these two blokes. So, um, I, I didn't realise this was going on, so I'm struggling with this one copper. And I'm pulling, I'm, I'm proper going crazy in this, I'm not assaulting them on out, I'm just trying to fucking run away, I'm trying to put, get them off my fucking wrists. Well, in any case, this, this other busy starts spraying as we say, yes, gas. So I start pulling harder and trying to run faster. And the, the busy slipped, smashed his head up the floor, uh, ended up with four or five stitches across his head, yeah. a broken nose, and a. Uh, And I got charged with, well, I just remember the busy getting up. I just remember the busy when he fell, right? I remember him. And I was looking down at him. And I thought, I'm not going to kick him in the heat. No way. I'm nicked. I just have to own it. There's no way I'm kicking this busy. This cop I need. There's just no way. Me kick the cop I need. Oh. I'll be in serious trouble if I do shit like that, I tell you. I tell you no. But, aye, that's just a weird. And, uh, 
So I stands and I waits for all other busies to come and get his. They comes and they gets a hat of his, bends his up, and oh, they tortured us when they were bending his up. I couldn't see, my eyes were done in, and they wouldn't stop. They were abusing our restraints on us, and putting us through loads of pain. And I was passing and everything. Because I was standing on my ankles and my knees, and I wasn't even struggling. I was only struggling because of the pain. It was horrible. So we get to the busy, the busy house fell when the once the kids is up and the right van comes for us to put us in. And just before they put us in the van, the busy who had fell on the floor come up with us and his face was covered in blood, screaming at us, look what you've done to this. You've gone down for a very long time for this. I thought, oh my God, look at it. Look at the blood on this man's face. Look at the blood on his face. So, uh, Oh, I couldn't believe that had happened, just through trying to struggle. So, my lesson learned by that. Well, I went back into prison for two and a half years for that. Aye. But my lesson learned from that. If I ever get arrested again, do not struggle, Stephen. Don't try and run away on out. Just, just get arrested. Just let them nick you. Didn't do what you used to do and try and run away and going to the extreme and all that sort of stuff. I ended up back in jail for two and a half, yeah. Knocked me, knocked me, knocked me jail up at 20 years in jail. So I'm 47 now. I got back up and I've been here about four years. I gotta say, like, I haven't really achieved much with my life since I've gotten loot. I just managed how I feel and think. Cause I, I think so I from depression, anxiety. I get all that, but I manage it all right, and I didn't fantasize about crime, and uh, I feel good. I feel like I've got a stable environment around us, so I don't think that's going to change for the foreseeable future unless I start being a divvy, which I, I, I won't start doing that. And our people are getting worried because I've been with, uh, and I've done that, that interview, but I'm not bothered about that. I'm going to put my, day, my, my proper interview on that I was intending to do. I've been waiting for it to come out. It's called If It Le If It Bleeds, It Leads. And it's hosted by Professor David Wilson, Amelia Fox. And it's a podcast. It's not a it's not a one for YouTube, it's just an an old one. It's I and his Lord he's done some canny stuff. I didn't realise what he had done. You see, what started me with all this, I mean, well, we're just coming out of lockdown. Hey, I was kind of bored. I've been sitting in the house for two years. I've got to see my prison skills coming really handy through lockdown. Really did. Was, uh, was canny. Was canny. Gave us a lot of time to think. With all anxiety and all that, I'd calm my mind in. Uh, so I'm bored. Uh, and then I see he's a YouTube video talking about all the stuff that he, well, some of the stuff that he, that he had taught me about, about 80 months beforehand, because I'd been going up the farm to see him for about three months, but he just got sick of us and didn't want us to come back up, so, and I hadn't seen him since, so, and then I seen this video. Uh, and it just like triggered loads of feelings in us about my past and how I got lifed up and my relationship with Glover and all the crime I had done. I mean, I'm not, I, I mean, I, I wasn't, I was violent, but I didn't commit much violence. And I'm only, I'm only responsible for killing one person. That's it. Thank God. 
Uh, oh, you triggered loads of feelings inside us. So what I done was, uh, I thought I'm gonna write a book, but I'm not gonna write a gangster book. I'm gonna write about me and my journey and how I come to terms when we were killing someone in my life sentence and how what the consequences are now I'm out of prison with where my life is and that. Uh, so so that's what I, that's what triggered in me because I was just sick of people glorifying what happened in Newcastle and stuff and that and thinking that it was all all right when it wasn't. So I'm gonna say that it's not, I'm gonna say why it wasn't all right. So I reached out to the professor. Uh, a normal little from from Grandin. Uh, I'd been in therapy for about three, four years or something, and I'd been doing all right, but I still had me things going on for us and a few challenges that I needed to overcome around me uh, criminal behaviour and that, and me criminal four patterns, and I needed to understand more about me offending behaviour. So I got asked to go on a conference. It was, uh, the professor had organised a conference at Grandin and there was criminal psychologists from all over the world, Europe, Russia, all over, America, all over the place, come to Grandin. And I got asked if I would do questions and answers on the conference, what a mic and give a give a talk about my offending behaviour and my understanding of it and how I think it's helping us and talk, and talk about my violence. Uh, it was kind of scary and had all these people in front of us. But uh, they were kind of all right with us. And I understood everything that every question that was asked and I answered it, answered them really good, I believe. And I did. Uh, but they were nice with us. Uh, and I got a big self-esteem boost from all that, and it was really great, and it, it moved us on inside myself. I felt I felt like uh, if I talked about stuff like that in a positive way all the time, that uh, I could let go of my past and move forward. And Grendon helped us do that, but I got put back in the prison system when I left Grendon for four years. I'd done three years in a sea cat, and it was hard work in them sea cats. All the drugs, all the criminality, Right? Virtually impossible for us to have a positive relationship with anybody that's not based around criminality. And it was really bad. And then the, the day cut for waste of fucking, sorry, waste of space, day cuts are a waste of space. You know? That just institutionalised us further. I mean, when I went to Grendon, it started to only institutionalise us. You know, it... When I landed in Grendon, right, the screws wanted us to call, the, call them by their first name. Well, I got a problem with that. You know what I mean? I like calling them boss or gov. You know, whatever I'm feeling on that day, I'll just say, boss, gov, and that's the end of it, boss, gov. You know, and that's the only, that's the only words they get out of is that's how, by the, when I landed there, a conversation with me with a screw, would be about three or four words, and that'd be the end of it. I remember there was one in Scrubs, when I was in Wormwood Scrubs, who was a scouser, John, he was, he was a hard 
and he, he, he tried to talk to us a few times, you know, and I let, I let him have a little, little leeway with us. So I start talking to him. Yeah, fuck that. Fifteen minutes into this fucking conversation, this fucking, this girl turns around and says to us, so tell us who's got all the drugs on the wing, Stephen. I said, no, no, but I'm gonna fall with you, a fucking snidey cunt. I says, yeah, I'll have an arm, fucking right away. And then I just thought, I'm not talking to these cunts. These cunts are just stuck as can't be arsed with that kind of shade. They know what cause yourself problems if you're grassing on the landings and all that. Everyone was alive on my wing at that time in Wormwood Scrubs. You know, and that was the first time I tried to, uh, uh, school tried to get friendly with us. And within 15 minutes, he's asking us who, who's selling drugs on the wing. Hmm. I need a drink. See you. Pardon me. That me. We're much group dears. Or very good for us. The help settlers in my life sentence. Uh, I've done three years in Wormwood Scrubs. I've done two years in in Durham, and then I went to Wormwood Scrubs. It's getting bloody cold again. But then I went to Parkhurst. I love Parkhurst. Parkhurst was a good jail. Well, the first six six months I was there, I was on basic regime with standard. First I was on I standard because. Uh, I never felt it was ever worth having enhanced in prison, you see. You never got an out. But when I landed in Parkhurst, they wouldn't give us a telly. Well, I had in, in, in Scrubs, you know. I didn't have one when I was in Durham. So, so I'm back to reading books and, and listening to the radio all the time, which was... I was a bit gutted because I liked watching the telly, you know. It helped take my mind off stuff and that, you know. But uh, I got my heat on it and it was all right. It was, it was canny. And then I got myself on a good wing. Uh, when I got me enhanced, took a six month, but I got it. And they gave us a telly. And I was allowed to cook good food. It was big, big, massive chest freezers on the landings. We could fill our food. Full of uh, pillar cases full of food, put them in there. Chickens, joints of meat, good food. Could have a uh, full English breakfast on the weekend. Great, cook a curry every night. Have a Sunday dinner, it was, it was great, it was bloody great. It was a great community that we had there. And it wasn't even that much villainous either, can none. You know, it was, there was no drugs. You know, because I had started to take drugs when I was in park in the uh, scrubs. I started to smoke heroin when I was in scrubs. And my parents and family were sending us money. And all I would do was pretty I wouldn't have a toilet in the in, 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 in the pad. I'd spend it all on heroin. And then I got I got off it. I never had a rattle leak. I didn't smoke enough of it to get a rattle, I've got to say that. I just chased that buzz all the time, struggled for it. I don't know, I might have had a rattle like, because I didn't really know what a rattle was back then. You know, but uh, every, and every time I had a joint, I got grassed up. Every time I had a joint, I got a, I got a piss test. When I was in Wormwood Scrubs. And I used to smoke it at the window. I would wait until... 10 o'clock at night. And the night clock is been and gone. And I'll have me Johnny at the window, sit and watch me telly. Bit of Billy Conley on the telly. It was great. A bit of hooch. I 
Oce bele beli conni, per creat, and next year, screw piss test. And I only get on to it that the people who were giving us the drugs are the ones who were grassing us up. Because they weren't getting piss tested and all that. Well, I, I bloody well was. So, what I used to do was, is I'd buy me bits of dope and that, and then I'd, I'd stash them, and I'd wait about two, three weeks for anybody, so anybody knew that I had dope, and then have me dope, and pass me piss test. But there was loads of snides in there, on that light well, when I got us here, who were telling tales on each other. I got us here and it got worse when the IPPs come. It just got to start to get really violent. You know, in the last year, Wormwood's Grubs started to get really violent. And I went, like I say, I went to Parkhurst. Uh, I had a great time there, knee, knee, knee craziness on that. Well, I did, I did have something that happened in the kitchens. <coughs> Excuse me, but uh, that got sorted out. So uh, I, uh, I've done done a couple of years there and went to, went to Grandin. Had a really good time at Grandin and hard time. I'm getting really cold. Can you know what you are? Can you hear the wind? Oh, I wonder if there's been any... I wonder if you picked up any ghosts out like that. Ah, so Parkhurst was a good prison for me. And Grendon was an even better one. And then I went to the hill after I left Grendon in the prison system, because I was just bombarded with the criminality. Uh, it didn't manage to pollute my mind, like, but it was chipping away at us all the bloody time. And it was hard work at times, because I did I not feel like smoking cannabis a load of times. For loads of times, when I could have, and I'd say I chose not to. I wouldn't have ever had a start of smoking cannabis again in the prison for at that time of my sentence. I would never have gotten out of prison. So So I stopped all that. Stopped all that crap. I dealt with all that. Stopped smoking. <laughs> with an hour ten years in prison. And then I started smoking again when I come out. But I'm not going to smoke it on the head again. That's definitely coming very soon. Just got to get my head in the right psychological place to, to, to just do it. Me fucking about just do it. I've never had that kind of action in my life uh, since I got out of prison. And I really miss it. I've had nice structure. I've put, I have had loads of things. I've had to understand about relationships. I'm in a relationship now. And uh, whereas in, in, I've just been locked up in a cell for years and had no relationship with anybody, you know? Uh, and then all of a sudden I get out and I'm in a relationship. And there's bloody kids involved, teenage kids as well, who oh, are a bit of a handful, but of course no. Uh, for... It's hard work. But I, I'll get my head on it now. And I, I, I'm starting to feel better for it as well. I feel more grounded for it all. I tell you that now. Do or not? I've just got to get my act together, put more action in my life, and I'm going to try and do that. 
and I'm going to start up a pad. Why not? Because, let's face it, he could deal with it, Dean it as well. A bit more action in his leg, and he'd be, he'd be flying. So I'm the admin, as you all know. I didn't really care. As long as I'm not breaking the law, now I'm married. As long as I conduct myself in the correct manner and hold myself accountable, I'll be alright. Be absolutely fine. I'll let that put some good content together. Some good content together and entertaining. Because I am going to talk a lot about murder and the feelings around, you know, that sort of stuff and what it must be like to, you know, I mean, to do a gang and hit on someone, right? And then get away with it. And then do another gang and hit on someone. And then get away with it. <sighs> that blows my mind a bit, that. You know? But there's loads of social structures in place that keep these things, keep these kind of relationships in people gang. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Because I've become familiar with violence. I felt it was okay to walk into a pub with a bottle of ammonia, a huge knife, and a sawn off shotgun. And I thought that was okay. I find it disgusting. I find it disgusting. But I found out that was okay for me to go and do something like that. I mean, what kind of a person does that make me? What kind of person had I become when I had killed? My victim. It disgusts us. It disgusts us that I've become that kind of person. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to hurt people. Not like that. Bloody hell. But then I thought, oh, it was, we talked about violence in such a way. And if I dreamed of hurting anybody in such a way, I ended up doing it. I thought I had the arm robbery and stuff like that and I'll get, I'll get as good as I can at it and see what I'm doing, see what I'm doing to feel quit. Take a bit of burg then, take some more car, take the car crane. The car crane was coming on top, but you could, you know, with the ring has an arm, but we were still getting them done and that. I could have gotten into that properly. But everything went tits up. People got took off the street for kidnapping and torture. I got left on my own. Well, not on my own, but it felt like I was on my own. I loved the street. When I was on that street, I loved it. I loved just being on the street. Walking on the streets when I was young and right away. I mean, you, the more you were on the street back then, the more you were in touch with all the 
with the busies and what was going on on the street and the crime and the burgling and you were just you just were emotionally in touch with everything that was going on in the street like that so you knew how so I knew how to get a get in and out uh, anywhere in the West End of Newcastle without getting seen of anybody. This day, I can still be like, I can still get in that Newcastle, that West End, with nobody seeing us. The only time when I go over there and anybody sees me over there, that's because I don't mind being seen these days. But if I didn't want to be seen, I didn't get seen. It's simple as. The street back then, I mean, I went the Townside riots. Whew. That was a brilliant time, but we destroyed everything. The way we were living our lives at that time, it could have carried on for a lot longer had we not done the Townside riots. But, and I was smack bang in the middle of it. Who said that, Bobby Shafter? When I got the ride shields out, oh yeah, we didn't give ground like three nights, three nights we had them busies, we had them streets, full control of the streets, three nights. I didn't set them out on fire, I burgled places, I took advantage of that way, but I didn't set them out on fire, and I did mess about with cars and stuff like that. But I'm not a fire bug. Right, but the Tyneside Rise were a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant time for us. Feeling totally lawless, like the, the, just the laws of society just didn't govern me. Didn't govern me in my head. And I had loads of backup on the street, so nobody could bully us out like that, because I was just a little young man. Was it all right? I done some done I done some robberies at a really young age, and the kind of robberies I was doing uh, that I done, well, well out there like they were out there. Well, we're lucky we never got nicked. Had I carried on doing them like that, we were getting nicked. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk to us on If It Bleeds, It Leads. And of course, um, I last met you when you were at HMP Grendon. And Grendon will form some part of the discussion that we want to have with you. But we're incredibly grateful because we know that this is a very difficult subject area to talk about. And we, 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 are, we, are, we are appreciative of you and your willingness to be able to talk about these kinds of things. Yeah, that's no problem. I'm I'm happy to talk. Like uh, see, I, 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 it's been a long journey for me, and uh, me written, me offending behaviour is is very important. And uh, how I addressed it and how I carry on addressing it is important as well. And I, 
people well, want to talk about it. Can I, can I ask you, because I'm always interested in, in what makes us who we are today and mm-hmm. where we've got to today. And very often I think that can be informed by childhood. So can I take you back to early life and what it was like growing up for you, um, what your relationships were with your parents and with your family and with your friends? And maybe we can talk a little about that first. Yes, well, uh, I, I grew up in a place called Scotswood. Uh, that's in Newcastle. Uh, mm-hmm. My parents uh, were poor. Uh, we didn't have much money in the household, uh, but it was it was a good it was a good home. My parents had a lot of problems with me growing up because when I went out onto the street playing in the car parks and with all the other kids and stuff and that, it just it just went. How can I see it? It was good. It was good fun. Mm-hmm. But we were mm-hmm. all in the same in the same boat. We all, we all, all, we all had no money. A lot of what I call it, it it's a, a crime estate sort of thing that mm-hmm. I grew up on. Uh, there was a lot of lot of crime going on. Uh, all the adults around were on the streets. There was like a fagin on every street corner. That's what it was like. Right. You right. know. Uh, it just. <laughs> It was a strange experience because it was innocent as well, you know. Yeah. But the things that we were doing, uh, when we look back at it, like we would carry knives, we would, but we were just kids when we would do that, you know. Uh, we do, we'd, we didn't understand what we were doing really. And did your mum and dad know about that? They were together, your mum and dad. Were yeah, they? they were. Yes, yes. I... And did they did they know about what you were getting up to with your friends? And did you have a better relationship with one parent or the other? Were you able to talk to them in any way? No, I was quite resentful against my parents because my parents had this ongoing battle with us. They mm. were trying to control us and stop us getting into mischief and stuff. Uh, so mm-hmm. I was getting punished a lot. Uh, it was c- c- my parents, and I ended up resenting them because of that, you know, because the the outside influence was too much for for mm-hmm. my parents to deal with, you know, and I couldn't control us at all. I mean, when so I so it sounds like a bit of a tug of war between your peers who were pulling you into one world and your parents who were trying to keep you in another. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my dad used to discipline us a, a lot, and he, he he would lock us in my bedroom. He would he, he would put bolts on my doors and everything. My dad to try and nail my windows down. Um, my my windows were like it was a three story building, and my bedroom window was at the the third story. And it what ten year old I'm trying to climb out this window and lure doom with sheets and stuff like that. I mean, I used to sneak out in the middle of the night. Just, just to steal uh, now them ten pence pop bottles, and I was only nine mm. years of age, and I was three o'clock in the morning stealing pop bottles with the with the shop, you know, just for sweets. And me, pa- I used to drive me parents crazy. When I think about uh, it now. And did you go to school? Did I, you? Yes, I went to school. I went to school every single day because if I didn't, mm. I got punished off me parents, you know. But I never mm. learned how to read. It was just. It was a. It was a. It wasn't a very good time at school for me because I couldn't read, so I misbehaved a lot. I spent a lot mm-hmm. of time in the, in the the headmaster's office doing a jigsaw, and that's what they used to do with us. I used to do mm-hmm. a jigsaw in the office and all day, because I used to get kicked out of the classrooms, you know. So I. And did you have, what about your friends at school? Where did you fit in with, with friends at school? Were you, well, you I know, started, part of a gang there? Or, I did, or... yeah. Well, I started, I started stealing the teacher's handbags and uh, stuff like that with me, with me pals because they, they, they were older than me. They were always older than me. Mm-hmm. And I used to wag off the lower school and go to the upper school with me pals. Because there was one kid at the upper school who who never, ever went to school, so the teacher didn't know what he looked like. Mm-hmm. So 
I used to attend that that class <laughs> with me with with me pals, you know. Uh, and it wasn't till I was like I was in first year senior school, and two of my friends they were all like seventeen, sixteen, seventeen, and were this was like they come and picked us up in a car because I'd just get a new car off our parents, and they would decided to go to these woods. And they started gas sniffing. And one of them died. And I think since then, that's when we, all my innocence, I lost all my innocence then. And that's when... So things, you, were, you were there when your friend died? Yes, we, we got him out of the car. He, he's, I, I, I think he's... Because we they were playing a game to see who could sniff the gas the longest, you know. Right. So, in and, and like, I, I was terrified of gas sniffers and glow sniffers at the time because there was a lot of them about and they was they were mm. skinheads and they looked they looked really scary. Mm. Uh, so I wouldn't I was I wouldn't sniff it, but they were playing like I say, playing a game, see who could sniff the gas the longest. And one mm. of my friends, he's I think his throat choked up. He started to choke. We got him out the car. I tried to give him the kiss of life couldn't revive him, we put him back in the car, we drove him to the to the air uh, at the hospital and they I got arrested and took into custody uh, mm. and questioned uh, because the thought that I had uh, left me my friend, the thought we had dumped him and went away and come back and got him and it wasn't it was because we had getting him out out of the car and lay him on the gravel outside mm -hmm. and try to give him the kiss of life mm -hmm. and uh, it was a horrible experience but and my poor parents they got they got a, a knock at the door of the police saying that I was lying that I had died and I was in hospital <gasps> oh my god and is there anyone in that time that, you know, your parents aside that you could look to as a role model to talk to about the things that were going on in your life? Was there anyone at that time who you thought, um, oh, if I could, if I could reach out to someone and, and talk to them, I could choose a different path of life? Or was there an absence of that? The I felt my cho cho choices were very limited and I, I, mm. I, I didn't feel I could reach out to my parents mm. because I got punished off them a lot, you see, and I didn't feel I could reach out to anybody and mm. that's just the way it was back then, you know. I mm. just... I got put in a home, I think it was about six weeks, seven weeks afterwards because my behaviour just spiralled right out of control. And I went into Clavering House and I think I was in there for about a month or so and my parents just wanted us back home. They didn't want us in a, did, in a children's did you, home. Did you look up to anyone in particular, Stephen? Oh, the yes. people in the community who thought, I want to be like that person when I grow up? Oh, yes, yes, yes. There was uh, well, there was criminals about, big criminals, who were, who were doing... I don't know what they were doing, but they were... They were driving about in flash cars at the time and, and uh, they seemed to have a lot of money and I seemed to be more gravitated towards them because I felt like I had built up all my self-esteem as a kid in being able to get things by stealing stuff. Mm. So I felt that world was where I wanted to be. I did, did, you, did you serve any any custodial sentence before the sentence that you, you're going to receive, your, the life sentence you receive in 1996? I spent eight months on remand for reckless driving and street robbery. And that was, that was it. I'd never been, that was it. No, no, no prison until... So were you quite successful in terms of petty crime... Um, stealing, w w that gave you some status, did it? Oh, yeah, it gave us self-esteem. I was, 
I've, yeah, I, I was a canny little thief. I loved burgling. I loved stealing cars. It was, I absolutely loved it. I don't, I look back and I feel quite a bit of shame about it now, but, but my mind was in a different place back then. I don't know. Where was your mind? What did your mind think of back then? I was done nothing but conspire in my mind to commit crime. I wanted to be a, the best burglar. I wanted to be a good armed robber. I wanted. To, I, I was. I was a brilliant car thief. I could steal cars for fun. I wasn't the very best driver, but I was a good car thief. Uh, and I just felt like I wasn't governed by the. The laws, the normal laws of society, I felt like I, I, I was the total outlaw and I was, <laughs> I was totally free. I'd never, I never felt so free in all my life. Did you feel proud of that? That uh, you oh, felt like a total outlaw? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt, yeah, we, I used to deliberately go on, on the run from the police because it was like a competition round ours to see who could stay on the run the longest. You know, uh, and I used to only last about 18 months or something with the police looking for us, you know, and that was quite short compared to some of the lads who used to do it. And we, it was, it was crazy back then. Was, was there any love in your life at that time? Did, did you, did you feel that I had your girlfriend? Did you feel that you could get um, love? Eh. Uh, I, I didn't until I met a girl and then I felt love, I think, for for the first time really in a long time. Can you tell us what age you were and which year that would be? That would have been... I would have been about 18, 19 at the time. And that would have been in 1992. 1992. Yeah. And what did love feel like to you? Well, by then I had been committing a lot of lot of crime. So I had a lot of pressure on us. I was paranoid. I was suffering from psychosis. I was sharing voices. Uh, the crimes that I was committing were quite serious that I would have got a lot of, lot of prison for. A lot of people think what I was... What sort of crimes were you committing at that point, Stephen? Uh, armed robbery, burglary, uh, snatches on the street, <coughs> cutting car crime. I was, at that time, I was being... There are other stuff around around violence but I wasn't directly involved you know mm. can I ask whether you um so you talked about um sn sniffing gas were you taking other kinds of drugs at that time as well which either took away the thrill or gave you the thrill or helped with committing these crimes or made you commit the crimes well no no I don't believe that me that, that I wasn't taking loads of drugs, you know, uh, at the time when, in my first year seniors, when, when, when my friend died, uh, I wasn't taking no drugs at all. Mm -hmm. uh, however, because of me, when my friend dying and I started taking drugs, I started, like, I, I, I don't know why, I, I started sniffing gas and I started sniffing glue I started taking acid and I started uh, smoking cannabis. Mm -hmm. And uh, that brought on me psychosis because I yeah. kept on thinking that one of my friends was going to die or something like that, you know? Uh, and that's that's what started me psychosis and it just got worse and worse. Uh, uh, Stephen, this is the... this is uh, You've built up a good picture for us, I think, about your life... Uh, as a child, mm -hmm. into your teens, and now I'm taking you into your early 20s, and I'm taking you to September 1995, when you when you were still in your uh, early... I, I imagine that by then you're, what, 22, 23 in 1995? No, I'm just turned 21. 21. 
can can you tell me what was happening in the um, hour immediately before you're going to commit a dreadful crime you're going to commit murder what was happening in that hour before the murder takes place in the hour uh, i had i had re- i had received threats that because i had i'd been arguing with my girlfriend and like this year this was like one of the First times I'd ever really felt love for a long time, you know. Mm. Uh, there had been a lot of problems with me girlfriend and stuff, and that's what it centered around. Why? I, because I'd had an argument with my girlfriend. I think it was the day before, and I had assaulted her, and. Our parents had threatened us that the, these people in this bar were going to gonna, gonna uh, harm us in some way it was. I can't remember the exact threat. So I, I decided to, uh, to get to arm myself, to go to this yeah. bar and confront them and arm myself. So I went and got a gun. I went and got a knife. And it just so, we caught accused. I didn't really meet him until that night. He just decided to tag along, you know. Uh, so I booked a So you go, booked, you go into the bar, you've, mm-hmm. you've got your knife and you've got the, a gun and you have a co-defendant, de, co yeah. a co-accused, somebody that's going to be sentenced as well. Uh, and when... You confront the people in the bar. How do you feel at that point when you are confronting them, when you're challenging them, when you are threatening them? How does that make you feel at that point? That made me feel that I was taking control. It made me feel that I was... I, I was standing up for myself. I felt, I felt, I suppose I felt powerful in a way. Did you think this was a culmination, though, of everything that had gone on in your life until that moment? Did you, did, do, you do you feel this was something that was different, that you couldn't have behaved in the way that you behaved? Or did you feel that this you were on some kind of roller coaster that was leading inevitably to this particular form of conclusion i'm going to contradict myself i think that it was, I, I wasn't in control i think I, I thought i was i was gaining control of something else of the violence that was happening all around us that's what i think i was think i was trying to take control of and not where my actions, I was just being, I had been, I think I had been groomed to be really dangerous at that time. Who groomed you? Who was it that was doing the grooming? These were other, these were, these were other villains who were living in the area who, who had been in a gang war and stuff like that. They had just been locked up for kidnapping, torture. And I was like left on my own. Uh, yeah, that's. I would say that's a fair assessment. I was, that I, I was very dangerous at that time. And at that point, when you take another person's life, when you, it's not just a threat. You actually murder someone. That's... You're going to be punished for that. You're going to spend. You're going to be given a life sentence in uh, the following year. But um, at that point, when you've taken that person's life, how did that make you feel? How did you react to that? Did you immediately experience remorse or did you have other kinds of feelings? 
I, 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 I felt, I felt that it was, that I had done something so bad, it, it felt like, it felt perverted. It felt, it, I, I, suddenly for the first time, I, I truly understood what it was like to commit a serious act of violence against another human being. And it, it felt disgusting. It felt absolutely... Were you ashamed of yourself? Yes. I mean, I, like I say, I had committed a lot of crimes up at that point. So I was totally desensitised. I'd been around a lot of violence. And I, I was totally desensitised. But to, to take it that step further and actually kill someone was was a step step too far for me. It 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 totally blew my mind. It totally blew my mind. And I, it, I know that you're going to be arrested very very quickly for that offence. If you hadn't have been arrested almost the next day. Do you think you could have gone on and committed similar offences of the kind that we've just been talking about? Could you have committed murder again, given those feelings that you had of being ashamed? Or would you, would, were those feelings of being ashamed so overwhelming you could never have conceived of taking another person's life? At that moment in time, I, do, I don't think I could have ever conceived about commit another act of violence but however that the kind of lifestyle that I was leading I was always pushing them I was always pushing boundaries that I was uncomfortable with within that lifestyle and this was just another boundary that I was pushing that had loads of feelings because when you first start committing crime you know it's wrong and it feels wrong but the more you commit crime, the more you push them boundaries, the more desensitised you come to it. And it doesn't. F in the end, you don't feel like you're doing anything wrong. And I think that could... But, did you, but do you did feel... But did, did you feel that you felt something Yes, wrong? I did. I, yes. But... Yes, but I believe that... I could have... I, I may, may have been able to deal with their feelings over a period of time, especially being supported by my lifestyle, that would help us feel comfortable ab ab about committing further violence. I believe that is possible. Mm. I believe by, if you you suppress their, all them so them uncomfortable feelings and you continually suppress them and then your peers around you, they support you in them kind of behaviours then you you start to desensitise. You start to feel comfortable. Com I, I got comfortable easy with, with committing crime. I got comfortable easy with being around violence. And just push it. It was just one boundary after another. And I. The, but, but your parents, your parents weren't comfortable. Your did your 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 parents never committed a crime? They no, never. No. Did they? No. And even in the community that you were describing, there would be very few people who would use violence to the extent they committed murder. You, you were unusual in that sense, weren't you? I was, yes, yes. Uh, not so nowadays, but back then, yes. There was a lot of violence happening on the streets. There was shootings happening. There was... the, in in in. I was always on the outskirts of that. I'd burn out cars for 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 bits of bits of graft that had been going on on the street, and that I'd maybe steal the cars for the lads, you know. You're going to serve. You're going to be convicted of the murder in yes. 1996, and you'll spend. 17 years yes. on a light sentence. Yes. And I think we, Mills and I want to talk to you a bit about the life sentence. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Well... What, what was that like once you had been arrested for it? 
what was the next bit of the journey? Well, I was very vulnerable. I was very, 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 very vulnerable because I was shocked to the core with what I, with what I had done. And when I landed in, in Durham prison, the whole prison, most of the prison, wanted to uh, assault us and kill us. They wanted to kill us. That's, that's what they wanted to do. So I was put on provisional cat ear and put in a hospital block for, uh, for assessment. This is when I first, I first come into contact with uh, drugs, with hard drugs. What uh, kind of drugs are those? Uh, smack, heroin. That's what mm. I come into contact with. I, mm. I, I was smoking cannabis at that time. That's all, that's all the drugs I had really took, you know. Uh, but to Durham was a very bad experience for me because it ended up where I had loads of enemies in the prison and it ended up where the only people I was getting assaulted off in the prison were the staff. Uh, right. And that was... That was difficult because... When I go, I find it hard. I find it hard to, to put it all together. I'm sure you, you do. Let, let you're doing so brilliantly. Let me let me ask a question and see if that if that mm. helps. Given that so many of the other prisoners must have been in for similar offences, why did they want to assault you when you came in? Because I had been going round and taxing people in Newcastle and. I had burgled a lot of people's houses who I shouldn't have burgled, like criminal houses, and stole money out of houses. Uh, my my partner in crime was a uh, high profile mm-hmm. on the street, and it just created a lot of problems for us going into the prison. There had been gang wars going on. So when I landed in Durham, they, they, I couldn't go on the wings properly. I mean, they did put us on there, and <laughs> David, like you say, I was put in that environment. I was walking up and down the landings with jugs of, jugs of steam and scalding water, sh- screaming at them to see it would come on, come and, come and get us. And so I think I was prepared to commit further violence while I was in that environment. Uh, I ended up cutting myself and staying in the hospital, because someone said that uh, I could escape. So I thought, and, and all I had to do was get myself sectioned to the, to, the, to the mental hospital, and I'll be able to escape from there. But little did I know, I was already having a, a mental breakdown because of all the pressure. I didn't want to commit any more violence, but uh, the, the prison officers were putting would keep trying to put us in a situation where I'd, I, I would have to commit serious violence to protect myself. Mm. So I started cutting myself and I, I, I cut my arms and I cut my throat and the put us in, the put us in a, a, a hospital called St. Luke's. Yeah. I was there for, for, for three months and then I escaped from there and ended up back on the streets in Newcastle. Which I got caught like more straight away, and returned back to prison. In terms of what happens to you in prison, Stephen, and the journey that you've been on, how important and was HMP Grendon for you? <sighs> Grendon was. It changed my life because. In the prison system, they were just prepared for us to carry on through me, through me prison system, through me sentence, and not develop any insight into me offending behaviour or, or, or anything, you know? I mean, for the first, what, six months or something in prison, I got 22 nickings, you know? And I was very anti, anti-screw. I wouldn't talk to prison officers. I was an, totally, totally, and utterly anti-authority. And it wasn't until I landed, I was in Parkhurst, 
and the the psychologist turned around and said it is Stephen what would you do if so if if your house got burgled and you knew who it was and I didn't know how to answer that question properly I couldn't I says to myself I cannot say that I'll go and get the lads and go around and smash their heads and get me stuff back you know and it took us at least 15 minutes to think of the answer to phone the police you know, and that's when I knew I had something properly wrong with the whole way I was, you know, and I went to Grendon and it was the most difficult part of my sentence, but the most rewarding. Why was it difficult? Because I didn't understand anything about the relationships that I had been having, what they were based on. You know, how, how did I manage to kill someone? How did I end up in that position? You know, what, what? why did I think that it was... I, I was so criminalised, you kind of just rip it out of you. You mm. know, I've done something really bad and I've got all these thoughts and feelings and beliefs and I didn't want them anymore because I've done something really bad, you know, and I kind of dined out with them. I've, they're there, they're there. And Grendon helped us pull their mood. And look at them and examine them properly, especially around my relationships and how I form them, how I maintain them. And it, look at the my victims of crime, you know, because I was totally, totally emotionally detached from my victims of crime. You know, I didn't burgle in someone's house. I, I mean, that I like doing that. <laughs> That's not good, you know. Pushing them kind of boundaries constantly, it was very unhealthy. But Grendon, my group members used to say it was like pulling teeth with me, trying to get anything out of us, trying to get us to own my behaviour. I just felt out, because you, you feel like you're grassing yourself up to the authorities, yeah. you know, and... You've got to try and understand that you're not. That the authorities already know all this this stuff about you. And that you're yeah. remaining in denial and not speaking about it. You stay dangerous that way. You know, you stay wrapped up in that them criminal values. But you learn how to talk about it in a good environment with proper people around you. You can learn a lot, and I did. And you learn how to talk about it and take responsibility for it. And do you, you have you taken responsibility for what you did when you when you took another person's life? Oh yes, I believe I, I have, and I carry on taking responsibility for it. By the way I behave, by not reoffending, by not, by not having them criminal fantasies in my head. I still get them, but I don't let them play out to a successful conclusion. I stop that. I take I, I, I try. I take responsibility within my relationships. You know, it, which is important. Understanding what they're based on. Where my issues feed into them. You know, and how my issues can damage my relationships around us, especially my personal ones. And if you could go back in time, not not just to the murder, but to a point anywhere in your life, in your childhood, wherever it is, is there one thing that you think could have taken you down or a person that could have taken you down a different path? And what would you say to someone else who is in your shoes at this moment, what they could do to prevent that life? I think, I think if I had to learn to read at school, that would have made a difference to us. It would have given us, it would have helped us so I could build some self-esteem in the legit world, you know, but, nah, how, how, advise someone else, I don't, 
You see, with people like me, that intent, they're so intent on doing what they're doing. It doesn't matter what you see. They will do what they're doing. Your, your parents locked your bedroom door and nailed down the windows. That's, that's how determined they were to stop you going down the path that you took. But if you were in the position, as Mills has just said, to advise somebody listening to this podcast will have a son who they think, oh, my gosh, that sounds like Stephen Cook. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to that parent about what they can do to help their son from uh, taking a different path from the one that you took? You said learning to read, but was there, was there one other thing that you feel? Do you know what, listening to you talk now in a way that you probably couldn't talk and didn't have anyone to talk to so early on, is such a massive arc and journey to have come on. I find that massively moving as a parent myself, because I think that if you had had, you know, that ability, maybe things could have been different. Yes, I think... I, I... I think things could have been a lot different if I had to learn how to read when I was at school because mm. a lot of the problems were at school for me. Mm. Uh, we're, not, oh. we're, we're not having no self-esteem and not, not, not thinking that I could achieve anything and that that was the only route for me because I was surrounded by it. My parents didn't have a chance. They really didn't have a chance because of the outside influence. I think how, who who's influencing your kids it, outside the home is really important, you know. And if you can keep your kids away from f from them bad influences, that that's that will help a lot to to stop anything from this happening. Um, what do you do now, Stephen? What what's your life like now? Yeah, I've got a canny life now. It's I'm unemployed at the moment. Because, you know, I've, I, I still put my fending behaviour at the front of everything, you know. Uh, but I've got a family. I'm like a therapist to my family now. You know, the, 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 instead of a bad influence all the time, I'm so proud that my me, me brother can come up to us and he can be struggling with something and I can give him some good advice now instead of bad advice. You know, even with my parents and... It's it, it, it's a totally different scenario to the to the bad advice I would give them when I was younger. Have you got a good relationship with your parents now? Oh yeah, I have. Yeah, I've got a good with both of them. I feel so ashamed about the resentment that I had towards them, but they don't hold us against us. The 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 the, the supporters, the supporters, and the. Everything I do, as long as I'm doing the right thing, you know? Yeah. Stephen, it's been a very, very... These have been very difficult things to talk about. And it seems to me that you've spoken about them with great honesty. And, um, mm. and uh, you know, we can never turn back time. But um, I think that you taking responsibility for what you've done mm -hmm. and trying to make something better with your life mm -hmm. is a testimony to the work that you've done and also to the, a testimony to the work that places like Grendon can do for people who've also been violent. I want to thank you very, very much for joining us on If It Bleeds, It Leads. You're Massive welcome. thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having us.